So a study that we did a couple of years ago uh, was to look at where exactly the most transportation pollution is happening. What I mentioned before, this PM 2.5, so where are the highest concentrations of this pollution and who is suffering disproportionately from it? So we already know it's not, not necessarily new information. We can pinpoint where pollution is bad, but what we wanted to look at was what exactly are the percentages? How bad is this when we look at the data? Um, and how can that inform the way policymakers, other advocates look at solutions and where those solutions should be prioritized? Welcome to another in our series here on how we will emerge from the pandemic and uh, transform our public transformation, uh, transportation system. I'm Bob C., transportation reporter for WGBH, and I'll be your moderator this morning. I'd like to introduce our guest this morning. Andre LaRue is our co-host for this series. Andre is a consultant currently leading Mass Inc.'s transformative transit-oriented development program at the Gateway Cities Innovation Institute. Previously, he led the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance where he championed zoning reform and other policies to support walkable, affordable, vibrant, and diverse communities. We welcome this morning, Senator Joseph Bon Corey. He's the state Senator for the first Suffolk and Middlesex districts representing his hometown of Winthrop, as well as Revere, Boston communities, and surrounding Cambridge neighborhoods. He is the chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation. He's the chair of the Senate Committee on Personnel and Administration, vice chair of the Rules Committee, and member of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, Financial Services Committee, and Ethics Committee. Also joining us is Mela Bush-Miles, the Transit-Oriented Development Director at Alternatives for Community and Environment, known as ACE. She is a nationally recognized climate and environmental justice activist, as well as a regional expert in public transit equity, with years of experience building programs that achieve climate and transit equity wins for low-income communities and communities of color. And Paulina Moratori is a senior campaign organizer for the Clean Transportation Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. In her role, she manages UCS transportation campaigns in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states with a focus on mobilizing UCS members, activists, and other experts to reduce tailpipe emissions while building a cleaner, more equitable transportation system. Quite a panel this morning, and we welcome all of you. Uh, in general, the last few programs we have been doing have been dealing with how we will transform our transportation system as we come out of the pandemic, what opportunities that affords us to change how we do business and uh, how the pandemic itself may transform what our transportation system looks like. And this morning we're focusing on climate and health, the effects of transportation on health and uh, how we can improve the situation here in Massachusetts. And to get us going, we're going to turn it over to my co-host, Andre LaRue. Andre. Oh, Bob, I think we have uh, some poll questions for folks, don't we? Yes. Are you, are you going to tee those up? Let's, let's put the first one up right now. Um, we're asking you what percentage of greenhouse gas emissions produced by transportation in Massachusetts? You see three options there. And in Massachusetts, what percentage is from cars alone? So give us your best guess and we'll let you know the answers in just a few minutes. Andre. Today we're talking about transportation, health and, and climate and uh, the effects that transportation uh, have on both our bodies as well as the planet. Uh, you know, one thing with the, the pandemic that uh, obviously a traumatic uh, experience for many people suffering from, uh, from sickness or from unemployment, but another remarkable thing about the, the shutdown was uh, the fact that traffic went away, the fact that the skies cleared up, the fact that the noise, the, our communities got a lot quieter. So I wanna turn things over to um, Paulina Moratori from the Union of Concerned Scientists to uh, explain this to us a little bit. Paulina, can you uh, explain to us in the audience what the, relationship is between the transportation system, uh, our, our health, uh, as well as climate change? 
Sure. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Andre and Bob, for hosting this great forum this morning. It's really exciting to be here with Mela and Senator Von Corey. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Paulina. I work with the Union of Concerned Scientists in our transportation program. And one of the biggest reasons we have such a heavy focus on transportation is because it is uh, the largest contributor to climate changing greenhouse gas emissions. But not only that, um, but it is a major uh, air pollution driver of, of these local air pollu pollutants that impact our health. So when we think about transportation, there's a, at least a dual problem of both climate change and public health. Um, and when we think about transforming our transportation system, either through electrifying public transit, increasing transit, electrifying our vehicles, making more walking and biking available to people, we get these massive health co-benefits. So not only are we reducing climate changing emissions, but we're also vastly improving our health. Um, and one of the biggest health uh, pollutants I'll mention that we'll talk about a little bit more later is PM or particulate matter 2.5, which is a very, very small particle. It's much, much smaller than a, like the, the dimensions of a human hair. They're invisible. Um, and they become emitted from car tailpipes whenever you're using gasoline or diesel. And I think one other thing that I really want to emphasize that here in Massachusetts, uh, transportation is the only sector that has actually increased in emissions since 1990. When you look at other sectors, it's a really tough nut to crack and we are not going to meet any of our climate or health goals unless we really, really rethink our transportation system and start to transform it to a much healthier system, uh, particularly in areas that are, are most overburdened by the pollution currently. Now, Paulina, did you wanna show us, uh, you have a slide showing us where some of the biggest impacts are from pollution in Massachusetts? Yeah, I would love to show that. I'm also wondering, do we have results from the poll? I'm kind of curious, uh, kind of curious how people are thinking about this. If they, what they know the, if they know the answer to these questions. I understand we do. Here we go. Uh, Sixty percent uh, of you said that uh, forty-three percent was the correct answer of the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions produced by transportation. Um, and I believe that is the correct answer. So uh, a majority of our participants this morning got that right. And what percentage is from cars alone? 45% uh, of you um, said 57% uh, of you said 45%, 43% said 20%, and 0% uh, said 5%. So I believe 20% is the correct answer answer to that. So 43% of you got it right. So there we go. We have a very smart group with us this morning. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do at UCS is look at data that enables us to kind of advance different policies that we are interested in pushing for at the state level alongside partners and coalitions uh, in the state. So a study that we did a couple of years ago uh, was to look at where exactly the most transportation pollution is happening. What I mentioned before, this PM 2.5. So where are the highest concentrations of this pollution and who is suffering disproportionately from it? So we already know it's not, not necessarily new information. We can pinpoint where pollution is bad, but what we wanted to look at was what exactly are the percentages? How bad is this when we look at the data? Um, and how can that inform the way policymakers, other advocates look at solutions and where those solutions should be prioritized? You can go ahead and show the map. So this is a map of Massachusetts showing average annual concentrations of PM 2.5 from on-road vehicles. And what that means are cars, trucks, buses, anything on our roads that use gasoline and diesel to power them. And you can see the, the brighter, the darker red spots are the higher concentrations of this pollution. So you look at the Boston area, you can see some in New Bedford, Brockton, Springfield, 
Worcester along the pike. Um, obviously heavily concentrated here in the greater Boston area, also a little bit up here in Lowell. Um, and part of what we wanted to do with this was then overlay other census data on um, sociodemographic information and see what percentage of our population is breathing the most uh, disproportionate amount of this pollution. And what we found was that communities of color in Massachusetts breathe about 30%, about a third more of this pollution from transportation. And you can see the racial breakdown in this, uh, in this slide relative to the state average. Um, and what this is quantifying is the history of racist policies that placed highways through communities of color, housing decisions, uh, decades of decisions that largely left out communities of color from decision-making processes have all led to this system we have now where a disproportionate amount of this pollution is concentrated on our communities of color. And this is part of the problem we're talking about, but what we really want to get to is how do we uh, how do we rectify this and how do we move forward in the Commonwealth in a way that does prioritize communities that have been historically and currently overburdened, not only by transportation pollution, but cumulative impacts of all, all sorts of other environmental hazards and other um, unjust practices that have gone on for too long. So I guess I will maybe turn it over to um, our next speaker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think that uh, Mela, we want to hear from Mela Bush-Miles, who has a personal story about how air pollution has impacted her family and how she got involved in this whole campaign. So Mela, let's turn to you. Yes. So my family has, um, I have a number of people in my family that suffered from asthma and respiratory illnesses, specifically all three of my children and a niece and a nephew who ultimately, my niece and nephew lost their lives to respiratory illness over the past five years, unfortunately. So because of that, I, um, my son was suffering severely from asthma back in the 90s. And I wanted to see how we could be a change for what was going on in his life. Uh, so I started getting involved in going out to meetings in the community and ultimately got involved in a way uh, to address indoor air quality in the schools, in our homes, as well as working to address the issues around um, public transportation. And that was the next step as a mom and as a business owner I wanted to see how we could reduce um, the pollution that was going through the community. And I started learning about how much asthma, what the levels of asthma were in the community in which I lived in Roxbury, which had the highest rate of asthma back in the 90s in the entire uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I got involved and now fast forwarding to um, around the mid 2000s, I started working in the nonprofit sector and was able to um, work to bring Fairmount Line trains to our communities that were had a lot of diesel being just dumped as trains just passed through. And um, I then lived in the area that I was uh, working within in Four Corners area. And the train just went by and all we got was diesel particulates PM 2.5, I guess, and um, and and on our asthma rate in 2010, there was 22% in Dorchester. So this has moved me to really become active and to fight for better public transportation. We won four new stations. We figured if you're going to dump pollution in our communities with empty trains going for storage in Reedville, at least let us get a ride so we can go to the hospital. So we, we won four new stations and we continued to work to reduce the uh, cost of uh, public transportation 
to the Riders Along the Fairmount line. And now with ACE, we're working more on um, continuing to that fight as well as looking at the buses, how they're polluting. Um, and we're doing all of this to try and keep my children alive, to keep them breathing and to not lose any more members of my family to a respiratory illness. So right now we're doing a lot of work on trying to electrify the fleet, trying to keep the fares steady, reducing the cost of public transportation because right now during a pandemic, we've seen that uh, there was an economic downturn in our communities and the environmental justice communities suffered more uh, due to the uh, pandemic and the things that are going on right now. So we're working on zero emission buildings, zero emission vehicles and trying to clean up the atmosphere so that we are uh, the generations going forward in my family will be able to continue to breathe. I've become a grandmother and you know, I'm really concerned about what happens to our next generations going forward. Thank you, Mello. That's, that's a great <clears throat> personal story and you have lived what we're talking about this morning. And Senator Boncori, how is the legislature and you specifically as co-chair of the Transportation Committee, how are you responding to these concerns which have even become more evident during the pandemic? Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, I wanna thank you, know, you and Andre for co-hosting uh, th this conversation about these very important issues today. I wanna thank uh, GBH and Massing for holding a series um, of conversations about transportation and the climate, um, because these are the two most pressing issues facing our commonwealth, uh, facing our country, and facing generations to come. So I'm very excited to be here with Paulina and Mela uh, to discuss their perspectives on addressing health impacts um, stemming from transportation um, and the impact transportation can really have on our climate. Um, because I think as a policymaker, it's important to hear from advocates um, and have these conversations. Uh, I can say the root cause and is that for far too long, we have managed public transportation in the Commonwealth through a business model, putting passengers second. And this outlook has resulted in an unreliable and unaffordable and overall unsustainable transit service. Uh, so we must shift the paradigm. Uh, that is what the legislature has endeavored to do uh, over the past two years and will endeavor to to do in this new session over the next two years. Um, and I'm happy to be leading that conversation in the legislature to ensure that public transit is a public good. Ensuring our transit transportation system is sustainable, affordable and equitable is so crucial to our health and economic recovery as we build out of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, those in, of us in policy making positions uh, really have a responsibility uh, to address the climate and public health as we begin to modernize our public transportation system and having the opportunity, quite frankly, to do it out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's why I'm so proud to have filed this year, the Transportation New Deal, a transit map for our goals to build on equity, accessibility and resiliency. The Transportation New Deal is just a starting point. It recognizes the set of initial policies that we must undertake to move Massachusetts forward in modernizing our transportation system and ensure regional equity and socioeconomic, socioeconomic equity really for all that use our transit system. Uh, we wanna build into our transit system. We wanna build up ridership on our transit system. And we wanna be, we want all of Massachusetts to bear um, really the good things that will come from that. Well, thank you for that <clears throat> very uh, progressive piece of legislation that you have filed. And I know that you don't expect it to survive intact as a lot of things don't on Beacon Hill, but you have certainly set a series of goals that are very uh, aggressive and meet the kinds of challenges we're talking about this morning. Um, we're going to eventually, of course, move into talking about solutions and how to address some of these problems. But, uh, and, and some of it does involve electric vehicles and electrification. So let's bring up our poll question number two, which asks people, uh, what kind of vehicle do you own now? What do you expect your next vehicle to be? And what is the most important consideration in your choice? So if you could respond to that for us as we move into our, our next discussion. 
And um, I believe, Paulina, you wanted to add something about the um, pollution uh, during the pandemic. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think it's a really important um, point to think about how things did change very suddenly last year. And we are starting to see transportation, both on our roads and ridership, pick up a lot. Um, so we, we do, I think uh, it's really important to recognize that we are um, going to, we are emerging from the pandemic and we need viable options for folks who are still, who are going to work every day. Um, and relating to PM 2.5, um, folks may have seen this, but I think it's worth mentioning about six months ago, maybe Harvard came out with a study linking long-term exposure to PM 2.5 with an increased uh, rate of death for COVID-19. Uh, so there was a connection, um, just thinking about disproportionate burdens and cumulative impacts in communities we know in the Commonwealth that have faced such uh, disproportionate uh, amounts of pollution also uh, were at the same time suffering disproportionately from COVID-19. Paulina, you had a, a map of the state that shows, I think, where a lot of the, uh, the impacts, environmental impacts are hitting. And, you know, I was struck by how it does seem to overlay with both communities that suffer from environmental justice issues, as well as uh, those impacted uh, disproportionately from the, the pandemic. Would you be able to put that up? So let me share my screen and try to pull up my this map. The map I'm about to show is something I collaborated on with some graduate students at Tufts University. So this is an online tool that anybody can use. We'll put it in the, I believe in the chat for anyone interested. Um, and this is a screening tool that we called Mass Roots, which overlays a lot of different environmental and uh, census data to look at again, similar to the map before, but with more detail. So it's not just transportation pollution, but it includes access to transportation, walk scores, bike scores, other environmental hazards, rates of asthma, rates of other respiratory diseases, other cumulative impacts um, that do highlight specific uh, census tracts as scoring very high within all of the indicators in the tool. So what you can do is zoom in and you can click on any census tract and it will show you a lot of the data for that particular area. So just for example, let's click here. Uh, and just the, co the colors, as you can imagine, the red, the dark red are the higher scoring, meaning most cumulative impact um, in terms of transportation uh, pollution and transportation uh, burden. So if we just click here, for example, this is somewhere between um, uh, whoops, sorry. Chelsea and right between Chelsea and Revere. Um, and you can look and see, first of all, what census tract it is, and then lots of other indicators, both ozone, PM 2.5, proximity to transit, uh, access to public transportation, population density, um, other population demographics all the way down. And what these uh, scores are showing us is how the census tract uh, ranks in terms of uh, both transportation uh, burden and pollution. Let me just try to click out. And if you, there are some maps uh, of the Commonwealth that we can also talk a little more that show where communities, what communities were hit hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. and. Needless to say, a lot of them do uh, overlap with what we're seeing here. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is this map was developed before uh, the new climate legislation in Massachusetts, which includes a new state definition for environmental justice communities. And that definition and the data used to show those communities is um, extremely complementary to this. You can look at both of them. I think both will make help make the case for uh, where what areas to prioritize. Um, clean, for example, clean transportation investments. Um, and another thing about this map is that 
Uh, there are similar ones in other states. California uses a map like this called Cal Enviro Screen. There's a national map called EJ Screen. Um, but the main difference between this map and something like Cal Enviro Screen is that we explicitly include race as an indicator, which Cal Enviro Screen does not. Um, and we think that's a really important thing that we need to consider as we think about history. Um, that's an absolutely critical piece of the puzzle and the data that we need to look at. Okay, and I think we have the poll results from our second question. So 18% uh, of you don't own a car, 64% or two thirds of you do have a regular gasoline powered car or truck. 18% have a hybrid vehicle, but no one has an all electric vehicle. What do you expect your next vehicle to be? 38% uh, of you said electric, 32% hybrid, 10% gas, and 20% none. You're getting rid of your vehicle. And the most important consideration in your choice is environmental, 52%, the cost, 34%, and the convenience or ease, 14%. So kind of fascinating. We can see the electric vehicle purchasers lining up here. And I guess one of the big questions is, uh, how are we going to move into this electric vehicle age? Because it seems like the most direct way of, of limiting air pollution, especially when we get to things like buses and trains, which is a much bigger um, you know, task ahead of us. And we also have people asking on the uh, Q&A line about, uh, diesel fueled private shuttle routes that are circling through much of Boston between medical centers, corporate campuses and the airport. What is being done to try to concentrate on electrifying the transportation that is within or most close to these communities that are most impacted by the pollution? So uh, I don't know who wants to take on that question, but I think there's a, an urgency to try to electrify as much transportation as possible, particularly in those inner city areas that are most heavily impacted by pollution. Yeah. I'm wondering if we could go to, to Mela first and then sure. to see what she thinks about how electrification is, uh, you know, the potential for electrification in, in her communities and similar environmental justice communities. And then I'd love to hear from Senator Boncori about how do we actually pay for this structural shift? So we've been working um, really hard to uh, address the issue of electrification because right now the MBTA has been reintroducing over the past uh, uh, three, uh, three to five years, they have been reintroducing diesel powered buses into our community under the name of enhanced electric vehicles. And those are diesel hybrid electric vehicles. So there's, you know, we noticed it when we were standing in Nubian station, uh, having a transportation rally, and we started seeing black soot coming out of the buses. We did not know that they had re-implemented diesel powered buses, and we could smell the diesel exhaust coming out of those buses, which we had fought to uh, change to something less emitting, but still emitting, which was compressed natural gas and had created an infrastructure uh, with that very expensive option. But so now we're looking at um, zero emission buses and we're, tr we're working to move the MBTA to do that sooner rather than later. There's also a pilot that the MBTA has agreed to do on the Fairmount line of electric uh, trains on the Fairmount line, the, um, the Providence Stoughton line. And there's three lines that they'll be piloting zero emission electric trains and electrifying those actual uh, routes. But the buses, they had not planned to change the, bu the buses in our communities until 2035, we found out while they're removing um, the overhead electric uh, buses uh, and trying and working to change those out in Harvard and Watertown, Harvard Square, 
to battery powered buses. So our advocacy with our coalitions is really working to get them to move in the other direction, to come closer to this time. And we're asking them to get the trains moving uh, within the next three years, but much sooner rather than later, we don't have time to wait or to waste. And uh, Senator Bon Corey, did you want to uh, comment on the uh, future of electrification? And of course, cost is a huge uh, uh, factor here, but what does your legislation say about moving toward electrification? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about it. I think with all transportation policies, we need to take an equitable approach when talking about getting to zero emission vehicles. Um, you know, even the poll questions we had today were all about, you know, kind of single ride, single ridership uh, vehicles. Um, and I want to thank, by the way, the 18% or so of you that are on this call that have no vehicle and completely relying on uh, public transportation or other means to get around. Um, because we definitely, we do have a lack of access to EV infrastructure, uh, but there's also a lack of um, access to ZEV, zero emission, um, you know, fleet vehicles and, and um, vehicles that move just more than one person, you know, you know, your buses, your train. So the electrical vehicle, the electric vehicle uh, legislation I filed or refiled, I, I should say, because the Senate did pass this um, bill last year. It's really an equitable, equitable approach to um, zero emission vehicle adoption uh, from school buses to MBTA buses to DPW trucks and fire engines in our municipalities to put Massachusetts on a path to being 100% zero emission vehicles uh, by 2035. And I know, Bob, I know you alluded to the cost and you know, there's always the question of, you know, what is this gonna cost? And I, we need to, when we think about transportation policy in Massachusetts, we need to think about shifting the paradigm. And the real question we should be asking is what's the cost of doing nothing? When our transportation system is in dire need of modernization and we choose to do nothing, the price of those actions falls on those who rely on public transit most. It falls on those in my district um, that from Paulina's slide you could see was heavily, deeply red. It falls on Mela's con uh, constituents and neighbors and friends uh, living in the Nubian, Nubian Square um, area of Boston. For years, our transportation system, our public transit system generally has been woefully underfunded. And as a result, commuters have faced unsafe conditions. We face service cuts that have come up again this year and really a lack of reliability general. Public transit is a public good. And it's about time we start treating that way and funding it that way. We need to prioritize public transportation. We need to think about our system as a way to move people, not just cars. And public transportation in Massachusetts um, has been just built on a different mindset. And it's been built on sort of a business model where all we're talking about is the cost. Um, and we need to shift that um, because as a result, fares are becoming too expensive um, on our public transit lines and communities are being underserved. Sure, we're gonna need additional revenue to meet these transportation goals. And I do have some ideas and policies on how to support that revenue. Uh, but the real cost we need to be talking about is the cost we've all borne, um, people across the Commonwealth have borne, and that's the cost of doing nothing. And that's what we've done for far too long in this Commonwealth. Well, Paulina, wanna... can I, go, can go I sorry, Bob. No, go um, ahead, Andre. Paulina, is electrification a silver bullet here for, uh, for transforming our transportation system? No, I, I, I do not think we can rely on any single silver bullet to, to get us out of, of this system we're in today. I think it plays a really important role, but when we're looking at a suite of policies, we really, as Senator Boncori was just saying, need to think holistically and need to really um, be creative and not rely on only one thing. Um, and so while the technology is appealing, you know, we have the, the technology for electric vehicles, it very much is here, both for personal cars and buses, uh, everything from transit buses to school buses and in between. Um, there are some, you know, mid-sized cars that are not quite available, but um, 
we can't just think about replacing every single gasoline or diesel car and replacing it one for one for electric vehicles because um, First of all, that doesn't solve our congestion problem. We need to be incentivizing folks and giving viable options to get out of cars and into public transit, which can be a climate solution. And I think often um, we forget that uh, public transit really is something that can be considered a climate solution in addition to all of the other benefits that it brings. Um, and so just to, you know, if we're thinking about also how you power electric vehicles, uh, I think what I would mention with that is that Massachusetts electric grid is very clean and getting cleaner. We're not at 100% renewables yet, but we are on our way. And uh, just uh, some data that we have, if you're interested, I can, or we can get this in the, in the chat. Uh, UCS has a, a report called Cleaner Cars from Cradle to Grave. And it looks at the entire life cycle of an electric vehicle, um, kind of dispelling some of the myths out there about electric vehicles, which is another, something else is, is kind of like the education around this technology is, has been challenging to get out there for a number of reasons. Um, and just one fun statistic to, to put out for, for the Commonwealth, if you plug in an electric vehicle today, let's just say a 2019 Chevy Bolt, which is the only fully electric car that that company actually offers, um, if you charge it in the greater Boston area, it produces as much global warming uh, pollution as a gasoline vehicle getting 129 miles to the gallon. So a regular car gets around 25 miles per gallon. Um, and then if you're thinking about the equivalent pollution, um, uh, an EV gets, would get the equivalent of 129 miles per gallon. And we have a tool that you can actually put in your code and figure out what your pollution is if you're charging on your grid. Um, I think that's maybe, I was going to say one more thing and I just completely lost my train of thought. So I think- Well, what about the, the, is there uh, the materials that are used to create electric cars? I mean, how is are there efforts being made to reduce the toxicity of them? And Yeah, yes, there are. Um, and I, I hate to keep saying I have a report for that, but we do have a battery, um, a battery report that we just released that talks a lot about batteries um, and some of the problems, some of what's working. Um, all cars have batteries. I mean, we all know this, like your battery, your car battery dies. Um, there are a lot of problems with the parts of the cars we already have. So I don't think, again, there's no one solution that's going to fix everything. Um, and another benefit I think we're, we're starting to see from larger batteries like bus, electric bus batteries is that they can help stabilize the grid through something called vehicle to grid technology. So when you're not using an electric school bus or an electric transit bus, there's a way for us to work with our electric grid and that actually helps balance the load on our grid. So there are a lot of benefits and really interesting things that these batteries can do for us. In addition to reuse, um, when a battery is done, there are ways to use it for um, solar or energy storage. So there's many, many things. It's not perfect by any means. Um, and I think a lot of the practices around sourcing the minerals and materials need to be improved. Um, but again, the cost of doing nothing, as Senator Boncori was saying, if we we're stuck in this system that's already causing us so much harm. Um, so no silver bullet, but certainly part of the holistic picture. This might be a good time to pull up our third and final poll question. Uh, which modern low carbon transportation solutions do you want to see in Massachusetts? Fully electric and more frequent public transportation options, more electric vehicle options and accessibility, safer walking and biking options, electrified heavy duty trucks, or none of the above. So let us know what you're thinking after our discussion this morning. We uh, do have some people uh, question, putting questions in the chat uh, function. Um, and one of them was about the increase in power plant emissions with electric vehicles. And I think you addressed that, Polina. Uh, Steven says, what about micro mobility options? One barrier to e-cars in cities will be the charging infrastructure. 
and micro mobility options, including electric powered ones, will be easier to accommodate than tens of thousands of e cars. What about that question of, of the charging infrastructure? Can anyone address that? I sure I can, Bob. Um, you know, I think public transportation, I think um, infrastructure for, you know, z zero emission vehicles is crucially important. For far too long in this Commonwealth, I think, um, you know, people, when people thought of electric vehicles, they thought of something that is something only like a suburban you know, dentists might be able to afford. Uh, but as we think about how to incentivize and create incentives at the state level um, to ensure that, um, you know, a program like more EVs, uh, which is a subsidy um, if you're driving an EV uh, from the state to, to the end user. Uh, if we wanna ensure that, you know, that's across the board, um, you know, in cities and towns. Uh, in cities, we're gonna have to think about where, where there's a lot of density, how to create public Public um, public charging stations um, on the roads um, create you know and I think we can do it with micro mobility. I mean I think that we need to do it with micro mobility. I mean there's no more um, you know climate friendly mode of transportation uh, than than riding a bike by than riding a bicycle and creating bicycle lanes and creating infrastructure for that. Um, so I think you know we need to really um, you know stop pandering to motor vehicles, uh, individual single user vehicles on our roadways. We need to re rethink our roadways that are as shared spaces uh, with pedestrians, with bicyclists and with motor vehicles. Uh, hopefully with very, very robust uh, bus lanes as well. And hopefully the buses riding in those are free. Uh, one question uh, was uh, directed toward uh, Mello who would like to answer it. And it's how do we improve transportation in Roxbury, Dorchester and Mattapan without further gentrification? So the question is the reason why I do this work. And that is, we have to build a voice amongst ourselves within our communities and empower ourselves. And then to speak to folks like Senator Boncori and to you know, advocate through um, with our public officials, our state elected officials and uh, local municipal, the mayor of Boston and so on and so forth. The way to address the gentrification issue is really a complicated one because displacement often follows improvements because then better public transportation becomes an amenity and not the lifeline that it is to our communities. And along the Fairmount line, what we did to address that was to actually go and look at addressing policies that are connected to uh, transit hubs, like, like the Nubian Square, like, um, like the Fairmount line. And that was really looking at changing the way that the, the city deals with it. And we wanted to improve access to jobs so that we could help to improve um, uh, income levels so that people would be able to pay to stay. Uh, so we've been working on that with some of the coalitions that I'm involved with. We're also uh, working on creating policy level changes to how people can stay put. So for example, there was one around real estate transfer, you know, so that people couldn't just flip houses in the community and then flip people out of there and they end up somewhere down in another city or town. Uh, also um, looking at like looking at taxes so that if someone built a house that was more expensive and the taxes went up on, on a, a landlord, then they wouldn't have to pass that on along because they would get an abatement on their taxes so we could protect them. So we put these special protection zones into place that we're currently still working on getting fully implemented across the board. So, it's, it, so that would help to improve public transportation, but also to help people to stay put so that they're not being displaced out of their community and to make the connection between transportation, housing, jobs, and health. And so we're working really hard to help people to see how, they, how that is happening. And another way to do that is to get involved with ACE and the T-Riders Union, because we go directly to the transit officials and we fight for what we want to see happen. We testify 
like Monday coming up, there's a meeting uh, at, with the Fiscal Management Control Board. Go to mbta.com, let your voice be heard, record your public comment, write it up, send it in, and, and say what you would like to see. If they've reduced some of the schedules on buses in, in uh, Mattapan, in Jamaica Plain, Dorchester, they've cut off whole bus lines and routes, and we're going to be speaking out on that. So this is my uh, little soapbox to tell you, get involved, T Riders Union, mela at ace-ej.org. You can email me and get involved and we'll um, link you into the T Riders Union. And that's another area that I direct with alternatives for community and environment. Uh, should we bring up the results for poll question three? And I knew, do know that some people said they wish they could have picked more than one option and they might've picked all of the options actually. But the one that was uh, the most favored fit 54% was fully electric and more frequent public transportation options. 9% um, said more electric vehicle options, 25% safer walking and biking options, 13% electrified heavy duty trucks. So thank you for that. One thing we haven't talked about is the change on the federal level. We have a new administration, both uh, President Biden and uh, Transportation Secretary Buttigieg have made electrification kind of a top priority of their policy. And some of these very expensive things that we're talking about doing might in fact uh, have, you know, be funded from federal sources. Uh, what are your feelings about what, how the federal government, what role it should play and how it can help uh, try to uh, minimize the air pollution here from transportation? Any one of you can jump in. I'd like to say that the, the federal government um, has infused some money into um, our local, uh, the Massachusetts uh, MBTA. Um, but what we really want to see is to, is to see how they can frame it as infrastructure. You know, when we look at infrastructure bills, public transportation has to be viewed as an infrastructure. It can't just be looked at some option, some other travel option. It has to be viewed in the sense of um, an infrastructure, just like a road, a bridge, the police or whoever else is there and be funded at a different level because historically you would get uh, public transportation would get 20% funding roads and bridges would get 80%. We need more funding to support public transportation in the same way that other uh, means and modes of transportation are viewed and fu fully funded. Well, in building, building on that question, um, you know, Mella mentioned that uh, some stimulus money from some of the, each stimulus bill has had some public transportation money to help support the MBTA and the, the regional transit authorities in, in Massachusetts. Um, so how is that money being deployed and how, uh, you know, what's breakdown in terms of operations versus capital? Like can some of this money be used to make this structural shift that we've been talking about towards a cleaner system? But I'm also at the same time, what's happening on the service side, right? Because as Paulina said, we need to get more people back onto public transportation which has been decimated. Ironically, you know, numbers of people using public transportation are way down, but I'm still seeing pictures of crowded buses and crowded uh, subway trains. So what, what's really going on here? And how can we use this money most effectively? Can I answer? <laughs> Let's go to the Senator first, I think, and then go back to you, Mela. Thank you, Andrea. It's something I, uh, I've certainly uh, thought about a lot. You know, the MBTA has received uh, through the last three stimulus packages, uh, almost $1.9 billion. Um, you know, and while the T service has been decimated, commuter rail service has been decimated, um, you know, when we've lost revenues in the neighborhood of 500 to $600 million, uh, the, federal, the federal government has really stepped up. Um, in, in this administration and provided adequate funding. Now that funding is really um, set aside for operation of our, of our public transit system, operation of our highway system, and it should be used as such. 
um, we should be talking about the paradigm shift I was talking about earlier. You know, we're going to have to incent to build back our public transit system, the commuter rail, the T. Um, we really need to incentivize people to get on these services. And how do we do that? We take the money that we've received. Uh, we should be putting it into programs like fare free buses on the MBTA and RTA services. We should be funding low, a low, low income fare program. We should be initiating fare freezes across the system. Um, and if this stuff sounds familiar, Andre, it's because all of the stuff is included in my new bill. Uh, but that's how we should be using the operational subsidies uh, that we're getting from the federal government. Uh, there still is going to be a need for capital, the infusion of capital dollars um, into our you know, public transit system. Um, I will say last year, the state, uh, the Senate, the House agreed, the governor signed uh, a nearly $18 billion transportation bond bill. Uh, that bonds for the future of transportation infrastructure um, in the Commonwealth um, to pay for things like electrification of our lines, to, that pays for the modernization of our lines, and hopefully the growth of our transit network across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, we're conducting, what we've been doing is a lot of getting to the state of good repair, and that's been the focus. And the MBTA has really done a really good job, I should say, in spending money on infrastructure. Uh, the MBTA spent nearly... $1.2 billion in capital improvements to the system last year. That's almost a 50% uh, more than, than, than they spent in, uh, in 2017. Uh, so they are beginning to spend the money on the state of good repair, but we got to think about growing our system. Um, so I've been in talks a lot with the new secretary, uh, Secretary Tesla and GM Pofta uh, to express these concerns, uh, but it's really going to take a community effort uh, to ensure that the MBTA, MBTA uh, masked on generally um, are thinking about, again, like I said, moving people and not cars and incentivizing people to get back onto the public transit system. Because what we've seen is a reaction to get off that system and into individual single user cars. Um, and that's not good for congestion, uh, sustainability in our climate, or is what we're here to talk about public health today. And Mella and Pauline, I know also had something they wanted to say on this. Pauline, you wanna go first? You can go first, Nella. I'm going to talk about the federal level stuff again. Oh, okay. Um, so um, we really want to see, um, so we're in sync in lockstep with Senator Boncori around fair free buses, uh, around making the MBTA free because MBTA talks about fair box recovery too much. And it's the reason why when things were starting to open up and we were using words like post pandemic, that all of a sudden, uh, you know, the T came and cut the service and, and uh, which had a job, just amputated whole roots and things like that. And so we really need to see them come back around, utilize the funds that they have to make it better. Prior to the pandemic and up until the pandemic began, there were a lot of planning processes going better bus routes, uh, making better, you know, the bus routes um, projects and things like that. And if they could come and actually put the money where their mouth is and actually work to make it better, we could see something that is new and, you know, and improved. But, you know, at the moment when you should be improving things to go and cut it off, it, it didn't make any sense. And, you know, we have to, uh, we have to come back around and continue to advocate with them to um, make them make it a better system, not worse. Because the more the more that they um, the more that they cut, the more that people suffer, and they're not seeing that um, anybody who's on the T needs to be on the T. So if they say, well, there's only five people over here today, those five people had somewhere they needed to go. They've lost jobs. We, we've gotten a lot of reports from folks uh, where um, they, they're crowding on buses, they're crowding on trolleys. We have full uh, rush hour crowds happening on the T right now. And so we have to really uh, continue to move them to make sure that they're adding more service and not deleting. This is not the time to delete. And Paulina? Thanks. Yes, just bringing us back a minute to the question of, of the federal, the policies happening at the federal level right now. 
one of the most successful policy, federal policies we've had in the history of transportation has been the fuel economy standards or the CAFE standards, uh, which uh, were drastically rolled back under the former administration. And right now, uh, we're looking at potentially seeing that put back in place. Um, these standards create uh, mandatory uh, ways for automakers to continue to clean up their vehicles as the technologies improve so that they get better miles per gallon. Um, in addition to uh, zero emission vehicle mandates, which we also can expect uh, something like that to come out. But uh, what's really important to remember, and we, we started the conversation with this, is that transportation in the Commonwealth is the only sector that has still increased since 1990, even with the federal fuel efficiency uh, standards and federal EV rebates and federal dollars for transportation. So I think we need to think about uh, what's happening at home too. And in addition to what we can get from the federal government is what we can do on the state level with dedicated revenue, um, other infusions of capital to help this transition. We can't, we don't wanna get stuck in um, a trap of only one, uh, you know, relying on the federal government. Um, there's a lot we can do here at home. Um, and on that note, I don't think we'll have a lot of time to get into this, but in December, Governor Baker signed on to the Transportation and Climate Initiative, um, which now that Massachusetts has signed on, there's a lot in the works. I know Senator Boncori could probably talk about the bill um, in the legislature about this but it is a way for uh, revenue to be directed into clean transportation projects here in Massachusetts. Um, and the key thing there is to ensure that there are uh, guardrails in place to make sure that that money is used on projects that are most effective, particularly for communities who are overburdened by transportation. How much revenue could be generated by TCI? Do you want me to Everybody, answer, or Senator Bonkor? If you, whoever has the the answer to that question, I'm I'm curious. I you just I'm want to make sure that the revenues are used in in a way that benefits the communities, and where those revenues are going to go. That that's a concern of ours. Is how is that money going to be spent, and is it going to get back into the communities uh, that that need it the most? Uh, that's the concern. In, so that doesn't answer your question, but it does. Answer, no, that, but that's, well, it, that's it, critical. It's really, you know, Andrea, at this point, it's really hard to tell until we actually join the initiative. Right now, it's, um, you know, I know Rhode Island, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., and Massachusetts um, have agreed in theory uh, to join the Transportation Climate Initiative. But with more states, it could create more revenue. Uh, I think what Miller and um, Paulina have been talking about that's so important um, is the money expanded into environmental justice communities as a result of what new revenue that we've seen. Um, the proposal from um, the pact that the four states have uh, joined into is to expend at least 35% of revenues in environmental justice communities. Um, I don't think that's adequate. At the state level, I filed a bill uh, to ensure that 70% of revenues, um, you know, realized through the Transportation Climate Initiative, seventy percent will go to communities uh, that have really bear the borne the burden um, of bad transportation policies. Um, you know, that are surrounded in my district, uh, communities surrounded by airports and 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 highways and major train stations. Um, that seventy percent of new funds realized will be spent in environmental justice communities in the Commonwealth. Well, I want to thank everyone. We're actually out of time. Time flies when we're having fun. And this has been a great discussion. And as you can tell, there's a lot more to talk about. And we are going to continue these forums uh, monthly. And we certainly would like everyone who's attending this morning to uh, come back and hear what we have to say in, in future programs. But I really want to thank our uh, panel this morning, who's just 
been great. Senator Joseph Boncori, thank you for taking the time this morning to join us. Mela Bush-Miles, always great to hear you, Mela, speaking uh, on behalf of the people who really need uh, the help in our communities, and Paulina Moratori for bringing us such valuable information from her perspective from the Union of Concerned Scientists. And I want to thank Andre LaRue and also Annie Scheffler and Lauren Jo Alacandro for uh, producing this series. Uh, each one just keeps seems to get better, and we certainly hope that you will join us uh, in, in, our, in the future. And keep in mind that this is recorded, so if you'd like other people that you know who would be interested in this who weren't able to join us this morning, uh, we will be providing a link so that you can share this program with them. But uh, thank you all this morning. This has been great, and uh, carry on. Thank, thank you. you. Fantastic, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.